My name is Monk Grove for the Phileas Jazz Archive at Hamilton College, and uh, I'd like to welcome Putter Smith today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking. I'd like to congratulate you on two things, uh, making a living as a musician and, and playing what I consider to be the most important instrument in any band. Wow. That's that's a, a good good couple of things. Thank you for both of those. And uh, I, I I always thought it was kind of like my because I'm a bass player. When I listen to a band, uh, that that's what I'm listening to is the better the bass player, the better the band, and and that's how I can tell the difference between uh, Holtrain's. I mean uh, uh, Miles's bands. You know, I say, oh, that's Percy Heath. That oh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, Paul Chambers. Oh, that's uh, uh, Ron Carter, etc. For you, what is the most obvious thing uh, from that basis that tells you that who it is? Well, it's a, it's the time feel, and uh, there's also a. Uh, um, I read this uh, interviews of Pablo Casals, and he was talking about how. Uh, fretless instruments, although he didn't use that term, uh, you can always tell a certain artist by the way they use intonation, that you that's, that's what makes them sound like they are. And uh, so, I mean, like, uh, uh, who's the guy uh, with uh, Jimmy, with Duke Ellington that's credited with starting it all? Jimmy Blanton. Uh, it played sharp, but it sounded great. <laughs> wow. I've noticed that with, I never noticed it with bass players, but I noticed it with people like Hugh Masekela, the South African musicians, they seem to be above the pitch. But I'm not sure my ears can hear a bit of sharpness from a bassist, but I guess yours can. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like, uh, just a little, it's just, it's almost more like a feeling than it, and it really being sharp. And, and, uh, also one of my very favorite bass players and people is uh, Henry Franklin, who was who, uh, Hugh Mescala's, uh, bass player. Anyway. Yay, Henry. <laughs> yeah. How about that? I love, I love Mescala's music. We, we almost stumbled upon this question that I, I have on my list here. And that was the concept of time between bassists and drummers. Do you have people you've played with over the years where you really felt like we are locked in? And on the other hand, people that you never seem to be able to lock in with. Yes, of every instrument, not just drums, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the drummer when i play i'm playing with the drummer i mean i'm i'm that's where i'm getting my time is with the drummer and uh generally the drummer will say i'm getting it with the bass player so that's when you're both doing that that that's the uh that's that's a great thing and there are uh uh everybody has some something good about them um I, I mean, I love playing with different people, and there's some people that are very, very successful that I just do not capture a groove with, and and I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. Some people call it chemistry, but um, you know, it's like a thing where you go, oh, hmm, no, this isn't comfortable, but you're you still at a professional level, you're still playing good time just doesn't feel comfortable or I hate to even think about it. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> enter into the, into the realm of a train wreck, but you're sort of glad when the gig is over, perhaps. I, I was, okay, again, I did not quite hear the last thing you well, said. Well, I, I sometimes, sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, the gig was okay, but I was glad it was over. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good one. <laughs> I had an interview recently with a drummer named Ed Sof, and we were talking about this, this issue, and he said that 
I've played with bass players and the first tune I go, oh God, this guy really plays behind the beat. So what I do is I go with that bass player and lock up at the slower tempo. The problem is if when I go down to where he is, he continues to slow down. That's a problem. Well, that problem is easily solved by uh, next time he's on the gig, turn it down. You know, I, you know, I, oh, that's, I mean, what I mean is, uh, and they say, oh, uh, so and so is on the gig. Oh, I just realized I'm busy. <laughs> oh, that's you know, right. I thought you meant you turn know. the volume down and you meant take no, a pass. No, 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 no. I never fight, uh, I never fight the drummer ever. You know, it's a, uh, it's, it's just a, definitely a losing game. Yeah, that's the old, oh, I wish I could do it, but I, I'm already booked. Yeah. Oh, I just, oh man, this thing just came up. Yeah. Yeah. If you stall a little bit as if you're pretending to look at your calendar, right? Oh, look here. Oh God, I didn't see this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Man, thanks for calling. Uh, the, the physicality of playing the bass, did it take you some time as a young man to to, uh, I don't know, build up the stamina, the muscles to, to play the acoustic bass? Well, yeah, when I started in 19, my first professional gig was 1954. Uh, back then there were no amps and uh, all bass players carried uh, a packet of a little, little thing of uh, white adhesive tape like present day Congo era players have, you know, it's just, you just tape your hangers, you know, and uh, bleeding and, and uh, uh, blisters were, that was part of it. And you were digging in, you could, you couldn't just turn the volume up. You had to dig in, you know, and, and uh, uh, generally it was painful for a few minutes and then you went numb and, uh, uh, but that was that was the way it was done in those days. Uh, the uh, the physical part of playing the bass, yes, it is a very physical instrument, and uh, I was fortunate that I was surrounded by very good bass players and began studying classically when I was about fifteen. And uh, that's uh, my first gig was when I was thirteen, and it was pure guts. I mean, just. I, I don't know. Do you know that my brother is a famous bass player, Carson Smith? I do, as a matter okay, of fact. Gonna... Oh, yeah, that's that looks like him. Yeah, that's very similar to my brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, hey, uh, guys. that's his book. That's his gig with uh, Chico Hamilton. That's right. I know and all those guys. I know yeah. all those guys. I used to, stay, I used to see, see all those guys. I was, like I say, I was 13 when I started playing. I, I was about that age when he uh, was working with them and, and uh, 10 years difference. Uh, and uh, let's see, where was I going with that? Uh, you were talking about playing without amps and the physicality. Oh yeah. It. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the first gig, uh, uh, somebody came up with, my brother was famous in jazz at that time. And I was in, I don't know, ninth grade or 10th grade. And somebody came up to me and said, uh, you're Carson's brother? I said, yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, you play the bass? I go, yeah, I lied. <laughs> and and I used to, used to, he had left a half-size bass there that I used to uh, fool around with. And then when his records came out with Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan, I used to play along with those, not knowing anything. All I knew was how it was supposed to sound. And uh, I was playing completely by ear, not knowing anything. Can you explain and, uh, how that? Uh, sorry for the interruption. I th that term, not knowing anything, uh, I think is a, an important thing to say. Let me see if I can pin you down. What do you mean by that? Not knowing anything. The names of the notes, keys, chord changes, uh, proper way to hold the instrument. <laughs> You know, uh, I just, uh, I was, it was pure, what is it, visceral playing. I, and uh, uh, 
I knew what it was supposed to sound like. And I, from playing along with the records, I, but there was no caution at all. It was just bang, you know, bang, bang. And uh, so I took the gig. They picked it up. They didn't call them gigs then. Uh, that word came in a few years later. It, and uh, uh, I only had three strings on the bass, and I don't really remember which ones they were. But I knew how to uh, get down, as they say, you know, and just uh, I just got down. And, and within a very short time, I was working all the time and it consequently missed out on all the social events of my high school because I was always working and all that stuff. And at the time, I felt really great about it. But now I kind of wish I had learned to dance with all the lovely young girls in my, you know, we all have regrets, right? Yes. <laughs> was that first uh, gig at the Compton Community Center, um, was that a dance? Yeah, yeah. And what kind of tunes would they have been playing? Well, we were playing uh, things like um, uh, Moonlight in Vermont, Blue Moon, uh, and uh, there was a saxophone player out here uh, big j mcneely mm -hmm. and we we're playing all that kind of stuff you know it was basically blues which i didn't know was blues and uh you just just hammer in you know bang 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 you know just hammer in and uh and you know that the funny thing is if um if you get two bass players play and one guy plays perfect notes and doesn't have great time and the other guy doesn't know a damn thing and has good time, that will make the band feel good. But the guy without with bad time will mess everything up. So it's this music, uh, it's music which is kind of evolved from from uh, African rhythm. Uh, uh, that that's what it's totally dependent upon and, and that's one of the things i miss about the most modern music the jazz music where they don't have any time going it's like hey, come on guys come on you know but then i then i realize i'm, I'm like when i was uh, in my uh oh, 20s or something and and uh the the older guys the dick said well what's wrong with the melody you know what's wrong with playing the melody you know where do you know <laughs> And they they were the uh, they were the moldy figs, and then now I'm a moldy fig, you know. I'm with um, you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wanted to swing, man. You know, I used to belong to I don't know if it was the musicians' union or a, a people who made mutes or something. They used to send if you purchased enough material, they used to send you a bumper sticker that had it would say, "Play the melody." Oh yeah, <laughs> terrific! Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you start to recognize forms like the twelve-bar blues or the A A B A thing on your own? Like, oh, yes, the first one again. I'm sorry. Go ahead and, yeah, and say like you, you're you're struggling, but then you start to realize that the, the song is starting over, and I'm learning it a little bit every time around. That's 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 right. And uh, the first tune that I realized there were chords and that I kind of knew what they were was Perdido, which is one of the things that we would play in that those days. And I remember talking to the tenor player and telling him, look at this, you know, and, and showing him uh, I could play a C minor and then an F major and then a B flat, you know. And uh, he's, oh, wow, I didn't know that, you know. And because uh, we were all just... Uh, uh, ear players, and it's hard to believe, you know. It's hard. It's hard to believe. And but I read a thing about uh, some great players, uh, the Chicago jazz players, uh, the guys, famous guys, and who I'm sorry I can't name right now, but uh, they were famous and became famous and great jazz musicians, and they didn't know a damn thing. They got together and they didn't know a damn thing. They just knew what it was supposed to sound like. <laughs> I'm just reading a book about uh, Louis Armstrong, and he he talks about that and Ooh. King Oliver and some of those early records that that uh, like with the Hot Five. 
they they didn't have any music. They just knew the tunes and they knew how to sort of extrapolate on on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I believe it. Well, when you I believe you uh, have a long list of people you've played with in, of course, on gigs, but also in the studios. So obviously you had to expand your knowledge to walk into a studio date and, and fulfill that task. Well, at the, at the age of 16, uh, I can, I remember it. I can still see it clearly in my mind uh, that I received a message from God and I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that I was talking to anybody, but it was like, I had this, uh, uh, realization that this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm supposed to be a musician. And uh, uh, the, the uh, I was, you know, I read a great deal all my life, much more when I was younger than I do now. And, uh, uh, and I have my Mormon heritage, which I was never raised as a Mormon. My father was, and uh, he, uh, uh, so we had a list of ancestry, genealogy, they're deep into that. And I've got a couple of American Indian ancestors. And so I always kind of paid attention to things like receiving your totem and and all that kind of stuff, you know, and receiving messages. And I've just only twice as this has happened. And this all happened when I was 15 or 16. And, uh, uh, but I kind of went with it, and I felt like that I have had, had received my message from the the one, <laughs> whoever that is, who's not doing a very good job right now. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's an interesting story. Do you recall where you were and what you were doing? Oh yeah, I was in uh, Blue Jay which is uh, a suburb of Lake Arrowhead and uh, this in the mountains above, above LA. And there was a group of people that we used to go up there. One of the guy's parents had a large cabin. There was a piano there and there were about eight beds. And uh, uh, we would go up there every five or six weeks, we'd go up there and play all weekend, you know, and, and uh, uh, that's where I was. I remember it and I can see it. I can see it. I remember where I was standing, and I, you know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So from that point, did you feel it was necessary to start taking lessons to expand your, not only your playing of the bass, but your understanding of how music works? Oh yes, yes. I I began studying seriously when I was sixteen with with uh, the same guy that taught uh, uh, Charlie Mingus, and there was a bass player named Jimmy Bond here, and uh, um, all of the guys studied with this man whose name was Herman Reinschagen, and the book at that time was the Samandel book. That was the bass study book. And that was uh, put together by a guy named Fred Zimmerman. And in the introduction, Fred Zimmerman talks about how he was Reinschagen's prize pupil <laughs> and uh, like that, you know. Uh, and uh, so, so it was really a great privilege to have studied with Herman. But I've studied with, I sometimes I say 20 people, maybe. I Maybe I've, I've more than 10 people I have studied with. And uh, in school at that time, in high school, junior high and high, they were teach. They had harmony classes, which was a study of 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 actually study of voice leading. And there were usually about eight people in the class, and uh, I had that for about five years. And so I was studying and writing uh, uh, the stuff. And there was one profound book by Paul Hindemith called Traditional Harmony. And uh, so I, I, I attribute my knowledge of the interior of uh, harmony and voice leading and all that stuff from that, and then the other technique, and then I played as much as possible. And, 
uh, I was, you know, I was obsessive like, like one needs to be. <laughs> what was the, your record collection like when you were, uh, oh, I don't know, at 15 or 16? Bud Powell, Charlie Parker, uh, uh, Bud Powell, Charlie Parker, Art Blakey, Jerry Mulligan, Chet Baker, uh, Art Tatum was huge. I just listened to Art Tatum all the time, and all those guys. And then um, a few a few years later, uh, Billy Holiday came in the thing, and uh, um, I still listen to music. Uh, uh, when I find something I need, I I'm obsessed. I listen to it obsessively. Mostly, I don't listen to music at all anymore. But that's the uh, the record with um, Bud Powell and uh, Bird and and uh, jazz at Massey Hall, even though it's a big mess. Uh, Charlie Parker's, oh, Jesus. Charlie Parker, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest. Genius, like, and not, not you know, almost everybody else is building on somebody else. But Charlie Parker was, whew, holy my God, sprung forth from, uh, what is it, the, Sprung forth from from Jupiter, Jupiter's brow. <laughs> okay, yes, you know, I there's like, some kind of uh, historical <laughs> reference there. Yeah. Would you have? Uh, would there be any pop music of the day in your record collection? Let's say early rock and roll, or you know, later on Motown, etc. No, uh, I did. I just had a had a. a, a period where I was in the studios playing that kind of music. And, uh, uh, but we, uh, the, the jazz musicians always, and it was uh, reciprocated. That is jazz musicians always knew that we were far above the rock and roll players and rock and roll players always admired us as real musicians, but it's, that's no longer the case, you know, and I, I heard, I saw a show the other day, uh, and I think it was Quincy Jones said, uh, and he was talking about Miles Davis, he said, when money comes in the room, God leaves. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly uh, apparent that money is a corrupting influence. And uh, fortunately, uh we're still we're still an art. We're still really an art and still sharing. Yes, I remember reading a quote from you that um, I believe you stated jazz is still an art form because money can't really be a part of it or, or something like that. From me? Yeah, yes. quote from me? Yes. Mm. Well, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep this not so lengthy, but I saw a show... Uh, a few years ago about modern art, about modern art, the art world, and which I'm a, my first girlfriend's father was a mo modern painter. And uh, so I got real interested, you know, I was 15 or 16. I got real interested and started reading all these, reading, uh, looking at these pictures. I wasn't reading so much and uh, have a taste. And then when I was on the road and everything, I would, uh, would be at a town for, I'd hit all the museums and, Pick out and there. I have favorite artists, and and I I I feel like I'm an aficionado, aficionado even though I can't pronounce it. Uh, I love art. I love art. And uh, but the uh, this show was talking about in the fifties um, that the the uh, artists in New York that they would kind of congregate and it was this one bar. It was their bar, you know, like, uh, what was the name of the one the jazz guys hung out in New York? Famous. Oh, yes. Um, Andy's. Jim and Andy's. No, somewhere else. Something else. I can't remember. But it was one and uh, guys like Zoot Sims and everybody there, you know, they'd all be, everybody would be there. Bill Crow mentions it every once in a while. And uh, by the way, I find Bill Crow's writing so interesting. As do I. Yeah. yeah so, and uh, uh, 
that they would get together, all these artists, and they would share ideas, uh, share ideas, <laughs> and and they'd have uh, little exhibitions of their own work to each other, and and talk about they're working on this, and then they would all kind of work. I mean, you know, they'd all say, "Yeah, oh yeah, okay, good. That's that's, that's let's try," you know, and uh, uh, they're selling their paintings like like five hundred dollars was a huge amount to get for a painting for one of these people, you know, guys was like that. And then this guy come along who said, well, hey, I can turn this into a big business. And, uh, and he did. And I, I don't know his name, but he was like a art promoter. And next thing you know, these guys are selling paintings at uh, auction for like a hundred thousand dollars, you know, I mean that, that are now selling for 1.9 million, you know, but, uh, Everything changed. Everything changed. They no longer, they don't want, uh, they don't want to show each other what they're doing. They don't dig to there and hang out. You know, uh, their exhibitions are, you know, it's, it's, they become like very isolated and rich. And, uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, one of the upshots of the show is that, uh, people with, um, one of their main problems in the world is paying taxes. Uh, they'll buy a piece by a very mediocre, prominent artist. And I'm I'm speaking of uh, a guy named Jeffrey Koons, K-O-O-N-S. And uh, I mean, it, you go like, my God, this is the kind of stuff you'd see at Toys R Us. And I mean, you know, and I mean, and I, I really love art. I mean, I love uh, Di Chirico and all sorts of people and uh uh the uh they'll pay him 80,000 for this erector set thing and uh, uh and then 3 years later it'll be worth 2.9 million they'll contribute it to a museum and get a tax write off of 2.9 million dollars and it only cost him 80,000 you see i mean and that's that's the business that's going on in art and uh, there was one art critic that explained it very carefully, and I went, that's exactly what's happening, you know? Well, you can't sell a bass solo. <laughs> There's no physical product. Like, I, I see what you're saying. Of course, you can record it, but it doesn't have the same, it, it's not tangible. You can't own it. You can't own it. Yeah. Oh. That's very profound. Okay, I got a million of them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we'll just keep track of how many. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. <laughs> I'll, I'll mark it over here. <laughs> um, your list of, of studio work includes everyone from Sonny and Cher to Beck, if this list is correct. When was the last, do you remember, first of all, the last studio date, like showing up to play a part, when was the most recent one for you? Well, the thing with Beck was uh, last year, but that was uh, that was a total fluke. I'm not in that business anymore at all. It was a total fluke. Uh, there was a, a uh, country western swing player, guitar player named Smokey Hormel, and we met at a uh, uh, in New York, actually New Jersey, and I began going to see his gig in Red Hook, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. And these guys were really good country and western players, and I mean, really good, you know, really good. And uh, there was a swinging bunch of guys, you know. And uh, uh, I mean, I'd never, I never, I'm not a that kind of a player or anything like that, and. So anyway, uh, Smokey uh, called me up. And he says, I'm coming to L.A. and I got this gig and I want you to play. I said, man, I don't know any of that music. He says, I'll send you a list. It's all on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Because I like him so much. He's such a great guy. And uh, so I spent, you know, some hours getting it together and went and did the gig. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was silly, you know. I, I didn't mean it was silly. It wasn't silly. It was real. 
it was real. But I mean, I'm playing you know, uh, blue airs kind of bass, you know, bluegrass kind of, you know, like boom, 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 boom you know that. And I'm be, I'm 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 being real. I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not being silly about it. I'm you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm seriously playing it. You know, giving it my heart. And um, so th anyway, Smokey's a friend of Beck, and Beck came into the gig, and he says, "I want you guys to record." You know, so uh, we, you know, great. Okay, so we went over to Beck, and I made uh, a fortune. <laughs> In one one day, and uh, but before that, my studio work, Sonny and Cher, circa, um, that was in the mm, middle sixties, and uh, I, my dear old friend Don Randy, uh, I was working with Don uh, at this club. Six nights a week, making eighty six dollars a week. It, it gotten married recently and had second child, and uh, uh, six nights a week, and uh, we were very happy and and everything. And then and then he said we're gonna. He said if you get an electric bass, he says I can get you some recording work. And I said okay, fine. You know because you're supporting a family. You know and. And uh, I think we're renting a three bedroom house for seventy five a month. This is this is you know this different world. And uh, uh, so I began doing all these dates, and I was doing like five, sometimes five a week with all sorts of people, and you know all that kind of stuff. And I went into a uh, one day after about three or four years of doing this, I went into uh, one date. And it was for Cher, not Sonny and Cher, just Cher. And it was, just, just, I can't think of the guy's name. One of his names was Gene Ryder. And uh, he had written a real, on a, up a lazy route, written a real nice J James Jamerson kind of bass line, you know, like, you know, nice fun. And the producer goes, uh, to me, can, can you play it, make it a little simpler? I said, oh, okay. So, being, uh, can you make it a little simpler? Like, well, uh, he said, well, can you make it a little simpler? So I go to like the nastiest, dirtiest commercial and I go, bing, bing, bing. Bing, bing, bing. He goes, yeah, that's it. And at that moment, I decided this is not why I became a musician. This is not why I became a musician. And I just simply stopped uh, hustling those kind of gigs. And within a, three months, I was totally out. You know, I was totally out. And uh, and that that was fine. And then I began doing some really good big time work. And, uh, um, there's fellas, I mean, um, it's, we're on, the, on my, my career. So I was doing really good, good work that I loved and everything. And then I got called to do that film. I guess you've got, you know about that, right? I do. And I was going to get to that I, before we go there. Um, I've, I've spoken to LA, studio guys who did that three dates a day for years and years. It say say the, 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 they, the they would do these studio dates three times a day for years. Yes. And um I'm I guess I'm wondering how they continued to do it, contrasting with the fact that you said this is not for me anymore. I guess I don't expect you to speak for them, but perhaps it's a financial consideration or that they had enough other things on the side that kept them creatively happy. 
There are several of us that did the same thing at different times I've read about later. I mean, uh, I used to be on dates with Barney Kessel, and I heard that he he said, oh, you know, <laughs> F this, and uh, stopped. And uh, Carol, Carol Kay, I used to be on dates with her, and and uh, I was I was I did a lot of those <laughs> Phil Spector dates and uh, uh, where they had five bass players, you know, and uh, absurd, absurd. I never understood how how could that possibly work? Did he have someone write out the bass line so that everybody was playing the same thing? We're all playing Bing, 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 Bing. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's the truth. Yeah, it's all written out, you know, and that's where the kind of lines they were stupid. And we all we were all like, this is ridiculous, you know. And uh, he had a, a an upright bass, which was Lyle Ritz, and uh, Carol was singing Dano electro bass, kind of weird bass. Larry Nectar would be playing Fender bass, and uh, somebody else was playing guitar roan, and somebody else was playing another bass. And we're all playing the same thing. And and well, when uh, whenever Lyle, whenever any one of them would take off uh, to do something else, uh, Lyle would take their instrument and it's called me to play the upright bass. So, so uh, that's... <laughs> when you listen to those records now, if you happen to be in your car, you've got the oldie station on, first of all, do you recognize things that you played on? No. You do not? No. No, it was it was commercial, mediocre, and people tell me they say, "Oh, you're on that. That's a classic. That's a classic." Well, no, no, Charlie Parker on Jazz at Mansell Hall. That's a classic. You know, Art Tatum playing tenderly. That's a classic. You know, Billy Holiday singing uh, uh, anything. anything. Uh, you know, those are classics. Okay. Yeah. Before we leave that, I I just look to my left here, and amongst the people I see you played with, if this is correct, is a drummer named Jimmy Wormworth. Well, yeah, I met Jimmy in uh, in uh, New York uh, through Mike Canaan, which is came through which is actually through Jorge Rossi. Uh, I had a short period, five or six years, where I was going back to New York. About every six weeks, I would go for 10 days. I had a room I rented from Mike Keenan and his wife, Stephanie. And uh, uh, I was doing a lot of work, and I uh, I began to, to uh, turn down some work because all I wanted to do was play with those guys. You know, and Mike had a studio, and so I was playing. Uh, I would... I would get to New York about seven, or six or seven. A plane would come in at night. So I'd be at the apartment about seven thirty, you know. And he'd say, "You want to play?" And I, said, yeah. And he'd get on the phone, and an hour later, we're in the studio playing. See, that's that's the the wonderful thing about New York City. It's packed with people that want to play all the time, want to play all the time, and and uh, that's why they're there. It's, I, I. I uh, regret not having gone to, uh, I don't regret the life I've had, but I regret not having gone to New York when I was 20 and, and uh, come up there because it, it's really the jazz center of the world. I don't know how the people can make it there now. Rents are so high and, and their gigs are paying Fifty dollars and a plate of spaghetti, you know, and the spaghetti is a very important part of it, you know. <laughs> but uh, for your supper, I, I mentioned Jimmy Wormworth because he's from Utica, where I am, and uh, he, he was—he's a well-known local figure. Um, I found on the internet a video, and I wonder if you remember this came from 1987 from the Guitar Institute. And you're playing with Ed Thigpen and Ron, a guitar player, Ron. Ron Eshte. Eshte. And you're playing Oleo. And this thing was so fast. 
that <laughs> I, I, I got a, an online metronome and I tried to figure out the tempo and it was, it's so fast that it was off the chart and I had to figure out, okay, what, what are the beats per minute of the half note? And this wow. thing was like 320 beats per minute. Do you remember this? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, I, uh, I saw that someone sent that to me in the last couple of years and, and uh, I said, my God, how did I do it? How could I do it? I, I, I... And you played the melody. Well, that's the easy part. <laughs> it's, it's going bing, 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 bing. That's the hard part. You know, I had been a great drummer. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was stunned by that. Um, I had a quote here from uh, Chubby Jackson. And, and we were talking about, you know, as a bass player, we were talking about that. And he said, Think of you. I I thought of him back then watching Woody Herman's band and the lack of amplification. He said, a lot of times your arms and fingers get numb. You're playing, you start to shake physically at the moment. And then someone looks at you and says, take one. The laugh of the century. Somebody points to the bass player after 28 choruses. Your hands are like this. My hands were so ugly. I used to keep in my pocket all the time. Yeah, a light. absolutely. And he was playing without an amp. And he was a very good bass player. His son was out here for a while, Duffy. Mm -hmm. Very good drummer, very good drummer. I think he ended up in Miami. And uh, with Chubby was a very good bass player. Well, with a song like that, at that tempo, I'm, I'm trying to form a question here. How many of your notes would you not play if you were playing at a civilized tempo? Can you rephrase that? How many yeah, notes would I exactly. not play? <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there a just like, I'm going to survive this and I'm going to keep playing, but some of these notes that I'm playing are not really by choice just to keep the time well it's kind of all a choice i mean you just play the line you just follow the line i mean the way i play i'm just following the line and uh but uh i'm at the age now where i can go hey <laughs> you know and also they don't play at the tempo anymore nobody does yeah i think no. they outlawed that <laughs> No, no, it's uh, that uh, no, you just you just play. You're playing the same thing. You're just bass lines are uh, there, there's a certain we're kind of in uh, music of the fifties, sixties is uh, uh, there are a lot of boundaries in bass lines and uh, things that make it sound like a bass and make the comfortable make the horn player comfortable. That's one of the roles of the rhythm section is to be comfortable for the horn player. So generally, just roughly, you'd say, you know, you want to put on the, on whenever the chord changes, you want to play the root or the third of that note. And uh, so it sounds like you've changed chords. And uh, uh, and then the next ones are, the next notes are lead-ins to the next uh, one. So you're, you really have a fairly narrow, uh, a field of, of it's not like uh, Art Tatum playing long lines and stuff and ability to do that and uh, so the uh, the horn players uh, they need to feel comfortable just like the bass players need to feel comfortable when they're soloing and there are very few uh, uh, pianists that that. Uh, have any idea how to play, uh, how to comp when there's no bass playing, a bass line. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll just explain that a little bit. It's like um, what the bass, the bass provides a very strong definition of where the chord change, as I said, by playing the beat, the, either the root or the third on one. And uh, uh, when they're not doing that, while they're doing that, then other other people can do like 
you know, like Tempo says, going one, two, three, four. You know, those are kind of comping things that a piano player or, uh, or a guitar player would play. You know, and it's it's almost like what a snare drum on a you know older drummers would play, like like hits. You know, like little little accents and everything. But they are they just they're nice, and the, as long as you got the bass player, when the bass player stops playing, they don't help at all. They don't tell you where one is or what is them, you know, because it's it's an affirmation thing, you know, of group improvisation. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. No, I I know what you're saying. It's like players, piano players like Ralph Sutton and Dave McKenna, they had that thing that you're describing that that they had that left hand or yeah, that right. sense of of um, I can keep this going. But you know, going way back to when we started talking today. You've just defined really why I wasn't kidding when I said that the most important instrument in the band, I've always felt that the bass player is it. And, um, you know, the drummer can kind of indicate a different feel. Okay, we're going from two beat to four beat. But the, if the bass player doesn't go there, it's not going there at all. I I I <laughs> I bow to your comprehension. That's true. That's true. I it's if the bass player is good, everything's good. If the bass player is bad, everything's bad. <laughs> well said. Um, yeah. You probably have run into people who think that you, uh, when they find out that you play the bass, they probably say, wow, you're an actor and you also play the bass. Yeah, right. Instead of the other way around. Well, I don't run into that too much because the where I play is usually, they're usually audiences, jazz audiences. And uh, I kind of, uh, I have to say, because they, they say he's also an actor. No, no, I'm not an actor. Alec Guinness is an actor. Meryl Streep is an actor. You know, George Clooney is an actor. I'm a guy that was in a movie, but I was I never did anything special or anything. It's just a freak occurrence that put me in the movie. And my wife says, you got to do it. You got to do it. You know, <laughs> so. When, when you got on the set and got into that whole process, Coming from a world about the movie set, yes, the movie uh -huh. set. Okay. okay, coming from a world uh, in music where much of what you did was based and required improvisation, something different. Was it a shock to you to do the takes over and over, and it had to be the same way every time? Was it hard to adjust to that? Well, my wife was an actress, and she was very, very good. And she was into. Uh, she was never made. She never made any real money. She was in a couple of TV shows, but uh, uh, she. Uh, uh, I used to help her with. Uh, well, she was an improvising and really very, very good. Then when they had improvising theater, and uh, so I used to. Uh, uh, Whenever she would have a part that she needed to study, I would read it. So I knew how to read a script. But uh, uh, now I've story. I went into a, a rearranged rap, and I can't remember what your question was. Well, I just contrasted. Oh, I oh yeah, improvising. Yes. No, I never thought of imp I never thought of anything like that. It was just like uh, I called around to different people, and I said, "Jack, I'm in this movie. What should I do?" You know. And uh, I called Med Flurry, and uh, he was very—he was the only one that gave me good advice. Uh, he said, "Well, you know, just remember," he says, "they're going to shoot the—they're going to shoot the scene from different angles. Just try to remember what you're saying, what your hands are doing when you're saying certain things, and try to do it the same way." And that was the best advice I got. You know, like. 
So after that, I became aware of of uh, watch this thing, and you see Burt Lancaster in an early movie where he's eating with his his fork, you know, and the neck, and they cut away and they come back, and he's instead of his fork in his right hand, he's got his spoon in his left hand, you know, and they go, ah, oh, yeah, for uh, you know, but that was a really good, a very good piece of advice and from Med and. Uh, you know, and one of the actors I worked with, uh, I went the first day, I I said, well, you know, I've never done this before. I'm not. Uh, I, you know, if you can give me any tips, I'd appreciate it. And he, he says, just shut up and stay in the background. And I, and I thought, well, thank you very, very much. Now I know exactly who you are. You know, and I've worked with plenty of the uh, People like you before, and I know exactly what uh, you know. I just it completely. It actually gave me strength, you know, knowing I was dealing with a jerk. As, uh, uh, but uh, speaking of not jerks, John Connery, wonderful guy, wonderful guy, and uh, Jill St. John, wonderful chick. She was like a real musician's kind of chick, hmm. and she had been married to. Uh, uh, Tom, or what's his name? I can't remember his name. Singer that sings kind of like Frank Sinatra. Very good singer. Tom Jones? No. Jack Jones. Jack Jones. That's right. Jack okay. Jones. Yeah, Jack Jones. And uh, and she was lovely. She was lovely. But anyway, so it was, it was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so sad. You know, experience not to be not to be. Uh, I I don't know if, if I did the right thing to do it, but I did it. My wife said, "You got to do it. You got to do it. They're not gonna. You're not not gonna get another call like that." You know. And yeah, I was just imagining. Uh, you know, my wife and I when we have a little routine, sort of. When I get home from a gig, she might say, "How'd it go?" Or the next morning, if there was something of significance, I might say, "Guess what happened last night." So I'm envisioning the morning after that gig with Thelonious Monk, where this guy comes up to you and makes this makes this request. Oh well, that it it uh, it was months after after the gig with Thelonious. It was months later, and uh, uh, I was coming home from a pretty pretty stupid gig, you know, at which you know you work a number of in a tuxedo at a country club with an accordion player, you know, like. You know, you're 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 feeding your family. You know, and so I come home. It's about eight o'clock. My wife's standing at the door, and she's uh, my wife' father. And my wife passed away three years ago. My uh, my wife's father was a pugilist. He was a, he was a he was a prize fighter, and he was in the same stables as Jack Dempsey. So he was he was really good. And his wife said. When he starts, he says, it's either me or boxing. You have to give up boxing if you want me, his wife. And so he gave up boxing. And, uh, uh, and But he taught his daughter how to box, my wife. And uh, uh, she, uh, she, she would, when she would get angry, she would assume a pugilistic stand, you know, no, you know, she just would get into that stance. So when she was going to hit me, and uh, she was standing at the door, and he says, "You just got the call to go with Thelonious, and you better say yes." <laughs> so that's, that's terrific. Yeah, Speaking I mean, everything I, I everything I that I ever did is because of her. I mean, she she was a most wonderful partner for for me. And for a jazz musician, because she loved the music. You were speaking about comping from piano players. I wonder if working with Thelonious and his distinctive style of playing um, affected the way you played. Did you feel you needed to play slightly different with him? No, no, I I was... Uh... Uh, I was playing for Thelonious, and I had been listening to Thelonious since I was 16 and and avidly and uh, very familiar with his music. And I had transcribed some of his more difficult tunes 
And on the West Coast, there weren't very many people that were into Thelonious at all. And uh, but I I just really loved his uh, compositions and uh, uh, he has a peculiar way. And and as as years have gone on and I've broadened my scope of understanding of time, uh, what they used to say, well, you know, he plays these he kind of plays these trip these dragging these triplets, you know. And they, they certain way, and they go, that's Thelonious, you know, he kind of drags the triplets and this thing. But, you know, when I studied, uh, oh, I guess it was 25 years ago, I began studying um, five tuplets, you know, and I, I, so I spent six months study, you know, studying that, you know, and, and everything, and becoming like, you know, eighth note, five tuplets, quarter note, five tuplets, half note, five tuplets, you know, and to, and to where it becomes... And and the process for me has always been I'll get an idea uh, you know some for some reason uh, I want to do this and uh, so I spent this and then this time uh, trying to assimilate five tuplets and trying to put it in my playing and it wouldn't go you know and so finally I think it was after six months I said okay. That's you know, and then two years later, I'm listening to a playback of something I'm I'm on a recording, and I listen back, and I'm playing perfect five tuplets, and they don't sound weird at all, and the and the music the music is full of them, you know, like a lot of tunes, you know, a lot of tunes are full of five tuplets, and uh, and uh, and then when I heard, you know, I don't listen to Thelonious like sometimes maybe for five years, you don't listen to them, you know, and then. And then uh, heard a Thelonious thing, and I, and I realized that, my God, he's playing perfect five tuplets, perfect five tuplets. Only he's a, he's able to mix in triplets and sixteens and and five tuplets, you know, and throw it all in. But it's all in time. He's never he's not never dragging, you know. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, was it? Uh, a parent on the gig did, did he show pleasure or otherwise with the way the band was sounding could could you tell if he was pleased or not oh yeah no he uh i was called to work a week two weeks in san francisco and in the middle of the second week uh he had and i i hung out with him every minute I mean, and and he wasn't he wasn't he he wasn't strange. He was he, you know like they always picked him as a weird weirdo. He's not a weird, not at all, you know. And he's not a, effusive. He could go sometimes a couple of days and not say anything at all, you know. But but uh, if you're not afraid of large black men, you know, and all you have to do is be around a few, and you realize, <laughs> hey man, you know, like. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this is my own opinion. I think writers, first, they form an opinion like, oh, my God, you know, oh, my God, this guy is scary, scary, scary. It's going to steal my car, you know. And uh, and then when a writer is, they're going to pay you $40 to write an art, uh, a review of a performance. You have to go to the, to the gig, you have to go to the gig and buy a drink and uh, and you know, and you end up like, and uh, that a large amount of the writing comes from reading previous reviews, because it becomes like a uh, written in stone that Thelonious is strange. He's not strange. That's strange. He's a little bit shy, and uh, uh, and also he's a funny as hell. Funny as hell. But anyway, uh, so. Um, I don't know if if it was the in ending of the first week or the middle of the second. He said to me, uh, uh, "He says uh, you want to go to Shelley's with me." You know, he had you gotten a call to just the, the gig. The reason I got the gig was because they had he was done a tour of of Asia, and uh, Bill Cosby at that time was paying uh, jazz musicians who wanted to become actors. Paying their admission to uh, tuition to uh, Manhattan School of Acting, 
And uh, so the bass player and the, and the, the tenor player, I think it was Charlie Rouse, and I'm not sure if it was Bob Crenshaw, but it was somebody like that. They had to be back to New York, so the Sloney's got this last-minute booking in San Francisco, and so they were looking for a bass player, and I got recommended by several people who knew I knew his stuff. Anyway, he said, do you want to go to Shelley's with me? And uh, my tail is still wagging. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to yeah play. what a wonderful guy what a wonderful Best guy audition. <laughs> you know did he speak to the audience on gigs no he didn't do announcing or anything like that um he he one time he said something and uh, uh and uh, i'll have it's it very it illustrates his humor his theme song was Epistrophe. You know that song, doodle doo bay, doodle doo -dee. And uh, so th this one set, this is in San Francisco. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is there's a lady says something and then Monk says it back. And, and to get the thing, I'm going to just do it without saying he said, they, she said. And uh, uh, so you can tell I've told this story a number of times. Um, so this this set, he would play the head, and then he would get up and dance through the whole thing, and then sit down and play the thing out. Did that with every tune on the set, and then and then played the do the do do the theme to go out do 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 do. And then he stood up to dance again. The lady says, "Bunk, I paid good money to see you. Are you blind?" That was the thing, and the entire. The band and the entire audience just went, you know, laughed like crazy. That was definitely worth the price of admission, you know. And uh, and he would say, th people would say things to him as he crossed the, you know, going into the gig and such. You know, people would say something and he'd answer them and and uh, things that I thought were amazing. Other people were offended, you know, and. Uh, one of the things somebody said, what about God, Thelonious? God is my slave. Ooh. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> God is my slave. Yeah, baby. <laughs> that is unique. It is um, unique. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, sorry. So, no, that's fine. Uh, just to wrap up, are you a person who thinks about the good old days that reminisces and thinks thinks that things now are not nearly as positive as they used to be? Oh, of course. Of course, I'm an old man. I mean, that's that's the birthright of old men, you know. You know. <laughs> You know, this. I read this thing that said that uh, young people today have no respect for their elders. They have no respect for, like, you know, traditional ways and politeness. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, on and on. And it, it was a, a, a speech made by Cicero 2,500 years ago. So there you go. <laughs> well, musically, when, I don't know if this is answerable. But musically, when did the good old days start to pass? The good old days? I guess I'm thinking um, some of the musicians I've talked to, studio guys, they talk about this bit. Of, you know, some of them will be dramatic about it, though. I can remember when we went to A&M Studios and, and we saw the first synthesizer as if that was like an alarm bell going off. Has there been that was a what going on? Like an alarm what? bell. Like we, we've seen the future uh -huh. and we don't like it. No, I was in Japan and saw it there before it was here and I bought one. It was at eleven hundred dollars. And uh um it was like oh my god this is great. I didn't know no kind of an alarm bell. This is great. I brought it home and I was 
programming Bach uh, fugues on it and stuff like that, you know, because you could do it, you know, one note at a time. And because I'm not a piano player, you know, and, and uh, somebody came over and I said, "Listen to this," and I turned it on and said, "This is what I did this," you know. And I go, "My God, I didn't know you played piano," you know, you know, and uh, so it was like a great tool. And uh, but the the recording industry is a whole different line of work, you know. It's, it's like rock and roll, and there's uh, pop stuff, you know. And I mean stuff like uh, Johnny Mathis and Tony Bennett, quality, you know, Frank Sinatra, um, and. Uh, I guess I I listened to uh, the other day I listened just because I Taylor Swift you know I listened to her thing you know and I was like mm, that didn't bother me you know it was <laughs> that's about you know I mean it didn't bother me you know it wasn't like uh, uh, Mick Jagger that bothers me and that and uh, but I mean I feel like we're you know people that. I hate to use the word real jazz, but people that are devoted to improvising and, and that that that's evolving. It's been evolving. It's 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 just going on and it's a great art form. And there are thousands of young people involved in this art form and uh, as to how many of them will last. But with the good old days, I don't know, it's it's always like, you know, when you're. 20, you go, oh, yeah, man, I missed out on the good old days, you know, good old days for the last 10 years, you know, and I, was, you know, and so maybe the good old days is always old, the old days, you know, <laughs> geez, remember, remember back in, you remember back in, in uh, 2009, remember back then, you know, uh, gee, I don't know, I have to check my I notes. Remember that in 2009. I don't, I don't. <laughs> I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. I mean, I'm I'm getting I'm getting to the age where certain old things that were funny are now through like I've forgotten more than you'll ever know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, can you remember uh what's the next gig that's coming up for you? Hmm. Uh uh I'm doing a little concert at the Church, uh, Pasadena Presbyterian, um, um, in uh, uh, that thing with with a guy that I'm rehearsing with today. We're in the middle of making a, a an album. A Jeff Kalela, a lovely piano player. We're 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 doing that now. Recording next this uh, we're recording in a month, and. Uh, their work is very scarce, very scarce. And I, I'm at the point now where uh, I turn down far more than I do because, uh, first of all, I can't play a four-hour gig too too long. Uh, I'm I'm going to bed now by ten o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So uh, a gig that ends at nine is kind of like, oh man. It's got to be something really good about it, you know. I mean, I mean, it's just that's the way it is, you know. Yes. There's a magazine called The Sun, spelled S-U-N, and uh, on the back page they have little blurbs, and the theme of this one week was uh, the last years of your life, and, and uh, one lady said, uh, I'm just trying to fall apart gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah you know i'm going to keep that in mind in the next few years so it's yeah been it's a, real, a good one it's been a real pleasure speaking with you and uh, again congratulations on your career and thanks for sharing today well thank you i really enjoyed it very very much excellent okay and uh, do you have a uh, uh, is, is my daughter wants to know if she can watch this Yes, we'll be uh, within a couple of weeks. It will be up on our Phileas Jazz YouTube channel. And I will send you a link when we put it up. Really good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank right, you very, very much, uh, Amon.
I'm going to yeah. sign off and then we'll say our official goodbyes. Okay. So do we do that now or? Um, yeah, I'm just going to stop and pause this. Excellent.